Hello, my name's Dave Sivers and I'm one of the co-founders of the Beacon Lit Book Festival. I'm delighted today to introduce you to our um, special guest, Dr. Kat Arney. Kat is an award-winning science writer, broadcaster and public speaker and she's the author of How to Code a Human and the critically acclaimed Herding Hemingway's Cats, Understanding How Our Genes Work. Her new book, Rebel Cell, Cancer, Evolution and the Science of Life, was published on the 6th of August. Kat has a degree in Natural Sciences and a PhD in Developmental Genetics at Cambridge University. And she's the founder and creative director of communication consultancy, First Create the Media. Kat was a key part of the science communications team at Cancer Research UK for more than a decade, co-founding the charity's award-winning science blog and acting as a principal, principal media spokesperson. She also presents the popular Genetics Unzipped podcast for the Genetics Society, and she's fronted several BBC Radio 4 science documentaries, including the recent series, Ingenious, looking at the stories behind our genes. Stephen Curry of The Guardian has described Rebel Cell as engrossing and fun. And Robin Ince, co-presenter of The Infinite Monkey Cage and The Quest for Wonder, described it as a remarkable feat of information and fascination. So without further ado, over to you, Kat. Hi, everyone. I'm Kat Arney, and I'm here to talk to you about my new book, Rebel Cell. Cancer, Evolution and the Science of Life, which came out here in the UK on the 6th of August. And first of all, I'd really like to say thank you so much to Beacon Lit for having me speak because Ivinghoe Library was a key part of my childhood. I grew up in Pitstone and spent many, many years of my life in Ivinghoe Library, mostly rummaging through the asterisk section rather than anything more sophisticated, I'm afraid. And um, also the librarian, Mrs Cutler, uh, Jane Cutler, was really formative for me in helping to encourage a love of reading, a love of literature and just a real love of libraries and the importance of books and knowledge in my life as a child. So uh, it's really fantastic to come back as a published author. That still seems a bit weird to say that, but to, to come back and, and talk on home turf, I suppose, uh, at Beacon Lit. So thank you very much for having me. So I wanted to start by talking a little bit about why I decided to write this book. And I've always been fascinated by how life unfolds. So when I first learned about DNA, this idea that there was a genetic code in us that controlled how our cells worked, how we came out, what we did, how our cells lived, died, thrived and survived, I became absolutely fascinated by that. And then more deeply, I became really interested in the process of developmental biology. So how do you go from one egg, one single cell into a baby? That absolutely blows my mind. And whether it's a human or a fruit fly or a tiny worm or a zebra fish, how do you, with one set of genetic instructions, when egg meets sperm, when mummy and daddy love each other very much, how do you take that single set of genetic instructions and unfold life out of it. And that was really the theme of my first book, Herding Hemingway's Cats, was to understand like, how do genes work? How do they tell ourselves what to do? How, how does this happen? And it turns out it's really complicated. Uh, and I went around the world, I talked to lots of different researchers and I said, I'm trying to write a book about how genes work. And pretty much all of them said, well, when you find out, let me know. Uh, and so that was a bit of a challenge. And so I thought I'd narrow down this time instead of writing about the whole of genetics, I'd just write about the whole of cancer. Because in many ways, the process of cancer is, is sort of the dark side of life. So when we think about development, we think about one cell becoming many cells in an embryo, then in a fetus, then in an adult, and those cells multiplying, specialising, dying, dividing, doing what they need to do at the right time in the right place. And then thinking about the development of cancer as almost like the dark mirror of that process. It's one cell that has wrong instructions, faulty instructions, 
and it's multiplying out of control. It's becoming many, many, many cells. They're, they're, they're changing, they're moving around, they're growing aggressively, they're, they're doing what they're going to do. They are unfolding in their own way. And that really started to make some connections in me. So I did a, uh, a degree in natural sciences at Cambridge. I did my PhD in developmental genetics, trying to understand this, like, you know, how do we go from one cell to many? How do you make a baby? Again, turns out it's really hard and it's much easier to be a writer. So that's what I do now. Um, but then I spent 12 years at Cancer Research UK doing science communication. So trying to understand myself enough about this process what is cancer? How does it work? How do we treat it? What's all the research that's going on to understand all the sorts of different forms of it, the different causes, the different cures, the treatments, and try and explain that to the public in a way that makes sense and engages people in the work that ultimately people donate money to pay for. So I did that for 12 years and it was incredible. I had some really amazing colleagues. I learned so much not just as a, as a scientist, I learned so much as a writer. I was really lucky to work alongside people like Ed Yong, now a very famous science writer who writes for The Atlantic. My colleague, Henry Scowcroft, who has a book about his, uh, his own experiences of losing his partner to cancer is coming out next year. So it was an incredible time to get such a broad view of this disease from, from the tiny, most intricate details of what makes cells multiply, the, the basic nuts and bolts, the gears of life that drive cell division, all the way through to end stage clinical trials and the more sort of sociological studies, trying to understand what really improves quality of life for people living with cancer. So it was an incredible education. And after a while and, and talking to people, I started to realize there was a, a story to be told about what cancer actually is. And this went hand in hand with the way that our understanding of cancer as a genetic disease was changing. So, um, you know, we always write down, we used to write down this sentence every time I, I had to write something about what is cancer. I'd write this sentence, cancer is a disease that starts when a cell picks up mutations and multiplies out of control. And that's the sentence I start the book with because I've written that so many times in my life. I'd never really stopped to wonder if it was actually true or entirely right. And that was kind of the cue that, that set me off on the, the journey to writing this book. Because during the time I was at Cancer Research UK, that 12 years there, we moved incredibly far in our understanding of the genetic changes, the mutations that drive cancer cells. And to this model of, you have a cell, it's picked up genetic changes, it's gone wrong, it's multiplying out of control, that is your cancer. So we developed techniques where we could start to track down, to map kind of genetic variations and comparing thousands of people with certain types of cancer, thousands of people without certain types of cancer. Can we narrow down the parts in the genome and then the genes that are involved in increasing risk? We developed techniques that enabled us to, to mash up chunks of tumour and look at the DNA in there to see, okay, what faults, what mutations are in this cancer? Those must be driving this disease. And then we developed techniques enabling us to develop drugs to target these, the products of these faulty genes, the faulty drivers that are making cancers run out of control. And it was a real kind of paradigm shift over that time in our understanding and it led us to where we are now. It's uh, what's sort of sometimes called like the precision oncology model of understanding cancer. So um, we have this idea that we will find out what, what faults there are in the genes and the molecules in this tumor in your disease. It's unique to you. And then we will, from that information, work out how we treat this cancer. So kind of matching drugs to, to faulty genes or drugs to molecules. And at the same time, it's really driven this understanding that scientists call the, the somatic mutation theory of cancer. And I like to call genetic bingo, that if cells pick up enough faults in the right order, they will become a cancer cell. They will, they will go out of control. So we've got these two ideas very driven by genetics in terms of like what drives cancer to, to grow. It's picking up series of mutations. And then how do we treat it? Finding those mutations and targeting them. 
And the more I started to look and understand and talk to researchers who were thinking about this in a slightly different way, I realized that that very genetic based paradigm was too simple and it didn't really work which as someone who's always been deeply embroiled in genetics, yeah, I've written a book about genetics, I do podcasts about genetics. This was weird to understand that maybe genetics isn't all that. And I stepped back and I started to think about cancer in the much wider context of all of life, which is kind of a biggie, I guess. So, um, you know, one of the big misconceptions I want to challenge in the book is the idea that cancer is a modern disease and it's a human disease. This is something that just affects us and is wrought by our modern, terrible, toxic human lifestyles. And this is simply not true. We see cancer across every branch of the tree of life. So a paper came out in 2014 and it just blew my mind it showed that a tiny organism called a hydra, so it's absolutely tiny, these things, they're basically tubes of cells with tentacles on the end, and they live in water. And some researchers found a spontaneous tumour in this tiny, simple organism. Um, one of the books I drew on very heavily to, to research my book is, is this, it's called The uh, Ecology and Evolution of Cancer. It's edited by Beate Jvari, Ben Roche and Fred Thomas. And it's, it's a very academic tome, you know, it's, it's full of text and diagrams and references. But one of the wonderful bits in it is, you know, 20 pages listing in tiny font all the species that we know of that can be affected by cancer. Java sparrows, silver gulls, brush-tailed porcupines, bowhead whale, uh, whales, Mexican wolves, tiger quolls, everything across every branch of life you can imagine, can get cancer. This is a deep biological process. Uh, there are a couple of really weird notable exceptions. Uh, sponges, there's no known examples of sponges with tumours, and also comb jellyfish. So, you know, who knows what their deal is. But when we look at all other branches of the tree of life, we can see this process at work and also going way back deep into time. So, for example, just with perfect timing, uh, on the day my book came out was uh, announced that they found a 77 million year old dinosaur fossil with an osteosarcoma, a bone tumour in one of its bones. There's a 240 million year old fossilised turtle that has been discovered with a tumour in it. And then looking to humans, when we look at all ancient human remains, the more people look for cancers and evidence of cancer, the more they find. And this is going back in populations many, many thousands of years. It's in adults, it's in children, it's a wide range of cancers. There's more than 250 well-documented and confirmed examples. And again, I think people haven't found cancers in ancient specimens because they haven't been looking for them. People don't take, you know, CT scanners and X-ray scanners into ancient burial grounds and, and look and see what's inside the bones, looking for signs of tumours. And also we don't get lovely, neat epidemiological case series, you know, graded by age so we can really understand how prevalent cancers were. But I think the fact that we find them at all and that we do find them in a range of, of of people, a range of locations all over the world, suggests that this is a deeply, deeply ancient disease that has been with us for a very long time. And we certainly do know that there are things in modern life that definitely don't help. So for example, one of the most obvious ones being cigarette smoking. There's a demonstrable link between people who do smoke are much more likely to get certain types of cancer than people who don't. And more broadly, when we think about, for example, age, so back in the history of humanity, there were lots and lots of things that would probably try and kill you before you got to about your 50s or 60s. Uh, nowadays, far fewer things in most parts of the world will kill you. Uh, so people are living, more of us are living to a ripe old age. And here's a curious thing, because the incidence of cancer goes up really quite sharply after the age of 60. And this is, again, deep, deep in our evolutionary programming. We have evolved as a species 
to get through our childbearing years out the other side in one piece to raise our families to hopefully have them raise children of their own and then i'm afraid and as a woman you know crashing through my 40s this is hard for me to hear like evolution gives up on us at a certain point and i think it's really not just understanding why do we get cancers as we get older but also why don't we get cancers when we're younger because if there was this direct relationship between the amount of damage that you pick up in your lifetime and your chance of give, getting cancer, you would expect that slope to be, you know, a, a slope like that, but it's not, it's kind of a scoop. So there is something protective in younger tissue that stops cells going rogue and stops cells going out of control. And if we can really understand what that is and what helps to genuinely on the inside keep us young and beautiful, then that points the way to real cancer prevention. So not necessarily worrying about what you look like on the outside, but what are your tissues like? Are they a nice environment that's keeping naughty cells in check? Because one of the ideas I come back to a lot in the book is the idea that cancer is not just something that emerges from a, a faulty cell that's got lots of mutations. It's a, it's a bad cell in a bad environment. So normally the environment of our bodies keeps rogue cells in check, but something happens that enables a sad cell, a damaged cell to become a cancer cell. And this was really brought home to me when I learned about some experiments that had been done at the Sanger Institute just outside Cambridge. Um, this is work of, of Phil Jones, Peter Campbell, Inigo Martin Carena. And they kind of flipped the idea of cancer research on its head. Because I told you that we've spent a lot of time looking at tumours and looking at cancers and understanding what are the changes in there? What, what's gone wrong in this chunk of tissue to make it become a cancer? And they kind of flipped it round and said, well, what do we know about normal tissue about why it's not cancer? Which is like quite clever, I think. You know, we focus so much as scientists on what's gone wrong. And we never really stop to think like, what's gone right? And so they got hold of some normal skin. And uh, this is skin that was left over from operations. Sometimes people end up with um, sort of drooping skin on their eyelids. They wanted to find skin that had been exposed to sunlight, but hadn't really been plastered in sunscreen. And it turns out these little fragments of skin from the eyelid are absolutely perfect. So they teamed up with um, a local surgeon that was doing this surgery and said, um, can we have your leftover skin? And the patients were like, I mean, yeah, I don't need it. And um, so they got these little strips of skin, they're kind of little wing shaped pieces of skin. And they punched tiny, tiny holes in them all the way through this, this sample of skin and did DNA analysis. And they said, well, you know, this is normal skin. Everyone's skin looks normal, a range of ages of people you know, it all looks like perfectly normal, healthy skin. And then when they looked at the genetic changes in there, it was shocking. It was peppered with mutations and not just like any old genetic changes. Some of these, if you found them in a tumor, you would say that that is a cancer gene. That is a cancer driving mutation. And it's just there in normal skin. And then they started looking at samples of esophagus, the tube that connects your, your mouth down to your stomach. And these were from um, people who died in road traffic accidents. So normal, there are no signs of cancer, completely normal esophagus. Um, and these people, you know, their, their, their families had agreed that, that their samples could be consented for this research. And they looked again at these tiny, tiny fragments and discovered, again, this patchwork of mutation in completely healthy tissue and it's really staggering it's a wonderful illustration so by by the time one of the the people was in their 70s and like most of their esophagus is made up of patches of cells with all kinds of mutations in there and when i went to see phil jones the chap who did this research he sort of he peered deep into my face and he said your skin is a patchwork of mutation and we all are and the older we get, the more mutations we have. I am a patchwork of mutation, you are a patchwork of mutation. And again, if we found many of these mutations in a tumour, we would say, that's a cancer gene, that's driving that cancer. And again, 
this is just normal life. So all our cells are a bit sad and a bit damaged. And by the time we get to a certain age, most of us is a bit sad and damaged, you know. And so what is it that really turns a sad cell into a bad cell? And it does seem to be that there is some kind of, not just a mutation, but a genetic catastrophe that happens that really sets cells going down the road to becoming cancer. Uh, scientists call this chromosomal instability, but it's sort of a bit of a, just a genetic disaster. Things start getting smashed up, cut and pasted around, things get copied, duplicated. There's some kind of big event that happens. And we're not really sure why or what drives that. But at the same time, it's not just about the cells. It's about the environment. And the environment in our bodies does change as we age. So again, messed up cells in a young environment, they're probably going to stay under control most of the time. Messed up cells in an older, more damaged environment, there's more of a chance that they'll go wrong. But it's really important to remember, and this I think was really striking, cancer is still rare. And this seems very weird and very transgressive and almost quite distressing when we think how common it is in a population. So around one in two of us at some point in our lifetime will be diagnosed with cancer. And you think that that is incredibly common. But on an individual, personal level, you are made of billions and billions and billions of cells and they multiply billions of times in your life. And out of all the mutations and all the changes and all the little kind of expanded patches of damaged cells, most of us will only develop one, maybe two new cancers in our entire lifetime. And some won't at all. So it's kind of, it's like winning a jackpot, you know, the world's crappest jackpot. It's the chances of 10 with 14 zeros after it. So we should really marvel at our bodies at how we have evolved to protect ourselves from cancer. So we need to think like, how do we do that? How have we evolved this? And how can we try and push that further? Because if we can even just push that out five, 10 years further out, that would massively reduce the number of cancers affecting people in late middle age, in sort of getting into like the golden years, the prime of life. If we can push the incidence of cancer further out, to almost like try and cheat our biology a bit, then that could genuinely be transformative in terms of, of healthy older age. So I think that's, that's kind of a positive message there. And it's a real call for research into prevention that does think about these themes in a bit more depth. But there's another angle on the, um, on the evolutionary idea of cancer, and that's when it comes to treatment. And it's not just our bodies, that are a patchwork of mutation. When we look at cancers themselves, they are patchworks of individual little kind of patches of cancer cells, each with their own genetic mutations. And even after a tumor has grown to quite a small size, there will be all kinds of diversity in there. And once cancer has started spreading with all this diversity, it makes it very, very hard to treat effectively. So the key thing that we must never forget when it comes to treating cancer and when it comes to trying to cure cancer is to detect it as early as possible and get rid of it. The surgeon's mantra, you know, nothing heals like cold steel is still very, very true. And there are some exciting new drugs coming along, things like immunotherapy that encourage the immune system to seek out and destroy cancer cells, but they don't work for everyone. And we don't know why. And in some cases they can make cancers a lot worse by tweaking the immune system in certain ways. So at the moment, I certainly want to paint a picture of, of a glass half full when it comes to cancer treatment. We know that half of all people treated for cancer today will survive for at least 10 years. And that's a figure that has doubled within my own lifetime. So that is definitely like, that is a glass half full, but it is also a glass half empty. And certainly looking at where we are with the, the new drugs that are coming along, that when you look at, are they actually increasing survival? In many cases, these incredibly expensive molecular drugs are increasing survival by months, sometimes single digit years. But there's nothing to me that says that that is the cure 
that we think we're looking for. And there's one paper which I think it really shocked me, actually. It was talking about a nine-day increase in survival. And all of these drugs come with side effects, and they don't bring transformative outcomes. There have been some drugs that have been incredibly successful, and there are some cancers that we can treat incredibly effectively. So I'm not kind of saying that the whole enterprise has been a complete waste of time. But I think that to get the rest of that glass full, to really, you know, make significant improvements that are not just measured in months, that are measured in meaningful years, we need to think differently. So I started talking to researchers who are trying to apply the principles of evolution to understanding how cancers develop resistance to treatment and how we can understand what's going on, learn their playbook and use it to our advantage. Because this is the thing, if you have a tumour that has lots and lots of genetically diverse cells and you apply, for example, a selective pressure in the form of a treatment, some of those cells are going to be resistant and all their buddies are going to be killed off and they're just going to keep growing. And we see this devastatingly in our real lives. You know, many of us will know someone who was treated for cancer and the cancer went away and then the cancer came back. And that same treatment will not work again because those cells are resistant now. You either need to try another drug, go through the whole process again, or think about different options or palliative care and say, I'm sorry that we're out of, out of options and there's nothing more we can do. And that I think is not good enough, especially now the progress that I'm discovering and I talk about in the book about alternative ways to think about approaching cancer treatment. And one of the most interesting ones is done by, um, he's a researcher in Florida at the Moffitt Cancer Center down in Tampa in Florida. And he's applying mathematical principles and evolutionary principles to understanding the balance of cells in a cancer, the resistant cells, the sensitive cells, and applying drugs with different types of timing to really balance those populations and keep them kind of, you know, fighting against each other without trying to get rid of them completely. And it's absolutely fascinating. There's a lovely bit in the book where I end up, um, he's very interested in, in game theory, like treating this game sounds too trivial, but as a game where it's doctor versus cancer. And at the moment, the cancer is always one step ahead. We're always chasing it, trying to chase it. If we can get one step ahead, if we can figure out where tumours are evolving to. And if we apply this drug in this way, they're going to go that way. Then we apply another drug and we make them go that way. Maybe we can even drive them to extinction or certainly control them for much longer. And the results that he's had in a clinical trial with prostate cancer patients, where the average uh, time to the cancer progressing on this particular drug is 18 months. He has men who've been carrying out these kind of cycles of managing the cancer for at least four years. If this was a drug, if this was a drug made by a pharmaceutical company, people would be all over the place. It would be front page news. And he's using an existing drug, but just in a new way. So as soon as the cancer starts to shrink, you stop treating, you wait for those sensitive cells to come back, and then you treat again. You sort of ride this roller coaster. And there are all sorts of other ways based on evolutionary theory, um, ways of occupying cells with trying to pump out drugs so they don't have any more energy to, to reproduce or, or be resistant to treatment, ways of boosting benign cells that aren't actually going to be dangerous, all sorts of really, really interesting approaches that are outside our normal idea of what a cancer treatment should look like. And I really would urge you, if you are interested in this, to, to read the book and, and follow through these, these ideas a bit more. Because I think we've just been misled, I suppose, by the myth of the cure, because that's what we all want. We all want the cure for cancer. It's become such a totemic idea in society that there is the cure for cancer out there, and it's gonna come in a bottle of pills, it's gonna be a magic bullet. And it simply doesn't work like that. For a start, you know, what cancer? Every individual person's cancer is an evolutionary one-off that starts within the body and dies within the body one way or another. 
So this idea that there will be one cure is, is frankly nonsense, but we want to believe it so hard. The idea of a treatment where you just kind of keep balancing it out, potentially for years where you control cancer and you steer its evolutionary trajectory, that doesn't sound like a cure, does it? But actually in terms of the life, the survival, and using less drug, fewer side effects, longer survival, compared to what some people may think are the miracle cures that we're told on the newspaper front pages. I think it requires a, a different headset, different way of thinking about this. So um, it is a real challenge. There was a very sniffy editorial in the Times. Um, Mel Greaves, he's the director of the Cancer and Evolution Centre at the Institute of Cancer Research in Sutton. And they launched this centre with a big you know, press, press, uh, press launch and all this kind of thing, very fancy. And uh, talking about this idea that the cure for cancer may look more like control and steering and maybe trying to drive it into extinction. And there are some really interesting strategies for that. But it's not this cure that has obsessed us, this narrative of the cure that has obsessed us for so long. And uh, the Times, there was a very sniffy editorial that says, take Cancer Research UK. The charity slogan is, together we will beat cancer. If its slogan were, as Professor Greaves might have it, together we will delay cancer, would it have raised enough money to fund research into more than 200 different types of cancer? Almost certainly not. And it sort of grieves me as someone who spent a long time in my life working for a cancer charity and using the language of, of beating and curing. Again, without really thinking, what does this mean? How do we bring this forward? And certainly there are cancers that we can cure and I don't want anyone to go away with the idea that everything is futile, we've made no progress. We've made incredible progress in many types of cancer. We have not made incredible progress in other types of cancer and in particularly advanced metastatic cancer, and in brain tumours, in lung cancers, in pancreatic cancers, in esophageal cancers. There are cancers at an advanced stage where we are really at a loss as to how to control them. And so thinking about these new ideas, these new strategies, you know, more than anything, I would like cancer to be gone. I would like, certainly not myself, not anyone I love, anyone I care about to, to be diagnosed with cancer. And I'm sure all of you too, I think it's an absolute B of a disease. It, it kills the people we love. It leaves everyone who, who's touched by it indelibly changed and indelibly scarred in so many ways. And I would like nothing more than for it to be just gone, eradicated. But the more I understand it as a biological process, an evolutionary process within the ecology of the body. We have to start thinking about it differently. It is part of us. It comes from us. It is deep rooted within our lives as multicellular organisms that are subjected to the pressures of evolution by natural selection. The same force that shaped all the incredible diversity of life on Earth shapes the terrible, terrible challenge that we have with treating advanced cancer. And we need to acknowledge that and accept it and work towards finding ways. Of course, you know, none of us is going to live forever. Only the gods are immortal. And personally, I don't believe that they exist. You know, we all have to die of something. And when I talked to Peter Campbell at the Sanger Institute, I sort of said, well, what's the end game? And he said, well, I, I guess it's that you live long enough to die of something else. And that's, for all of us, I think that's what we would hope for, that we would live long, happy, healthy lives for as long as we wish to, and that people would not lose their lives, lose their health to cancer in the prime of life. Because now that is, you know, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, people are expecting to live healthy, active lives. And, you know, I don't want to see people being struck down by cancer at that age and you know, I think there is a new way that we can think about this disease. So I will leave you with uh, the encouragement that if you're interested in learning more about these ideas, uh, the concept of cancer as, a, as an evolutionary force, 
and the ecology of the body and how that all works. Please check out Rebel Cell, Cancer Evolution and the Science of Life. It's available from all good and all evil bookshops. Uh, there's links to buy it at the website rebelcellbook.com and you can also buy signed book plates and I have a limited number of signed hardbacks that I'm happy to post out as well. So thank you very much for listening. I hope that you have found this engaging, interesting. If you have, please buy the book, please read the book, please tell all your friends about the book um, because I think it's time to tell a new story about cancer that embeds it in life and hope. So thank you very much for listening.